Uh, I, I, uh, there are more, I think most people didn't manage to get up at this time. Uh, so f I want to start, uh, most, of, most of my remarks will be mathematical, but I want to start with a couple of administrative remarks, and I hope that you will pass these remarks on to the large number of people who aren't here. First of all, of course, these, such a conference, a conference like this demands a lot of work from our staff, from Mary Jane Hayes, Michelle Hukanen, and others in the staff of the School of Mathematics, and also from the staff of the cafeteria, from Michel Raymond, the chef, and others. And in particular, we've been requested, although not to come over there before 1230, because we represent an additional burden on the cafeteria, so that they would appreciate it if by any chance the seminar, the lecture is over at 12, that we not come over then, that we wait until 12.30, and that we spread ourselves out between 12.30 and 1.30 when they start serving. So if, as I say, the lecture ends a little early, then find something to do, read your email, go to the, go to the common room, read your hometown newspaper, browse in our library, whatever, and uh, don't come to the cafeteria until 12.30, and some of you should not come until 1.00. <laughs> Uh, you'll be in good company, I think, that Deline doesn't go until one. Uh, so that's the first thing I wanted to say. Second thing is intended for speakers alone, and that is that these, uh, these lectures are being discreetly filmed so that you need to attach a, have a uh, microphone attached to you, and Michael Campton will, before each lecture, be waiting here so would the speakers please introduce themselves to Michael Campton so that he can attach a microphone to them. And I think the third is a, an announcement at your request, and that is that your lecture will be is canceled today. Okay. Uh, that's all. Now, I have various things I want to say, and, I, and some of them I want to say twice. Some I want to repeat for emphasis, and I only have a certain amount of time. So I have written them down. Now, that is going to make for a rather dull set of remarks, because I'm going to have to read them, and in order to liven it up, I will try once or twice to say something outrageous, and that will uh, help a little. All right, now, I want to start off by observing that the theory of automorphic forms is a little bit like the proverbial element, uh, elephant. How it looks depends very much on where you stand. So, for example, at Princeton University, they're very familiar with the trunk, but there are some people over there who, if you suggest that it have ears turn, has ears turn red and blue. <laughs> and, you know, for example, Harvard, for example, they're quite willing to talk about the ears, but they're not sure whether the elephant uses them to fly through the air or to swim through the sea. And here, you know, maybe at the Institute, to carry this metaphor just a little farther, we know, we think we know a little bit about the ears, but we're under the impression that the, say, the tail is of equal importance with the legs and the trunk for the elephant's locomotion and nourishment. So, it is not a very satisfactory state of affairs, and uh, it seems to me that if the subject is going to achieve its promise, the younger mathematicians attracted to it not only have to understand in some depth what that promise is, but they also have to acquire the necessary techniques. And these techniques are drawn from many and various parts of mathematics. So, for our own instruction, and that of the participants, the organizers of the conference made an effort to organize a conference in which each of the elephant's more important appendages is given as just due, and the beast is seen insofar as is possible in 14 hours whole. Now, most other members of the organizing committee will have occasion during the course of the conference. Dinfeldt is here, but this is a rather surprise, last minute decision on his part, so he doesn't have to say anything, but the others will all have to say something in the course of the conference, and they're going to present, they'll have a chance to present their different views, so I'm going to let, I'm going to take this opportunity to, ref, to present what are more or less, frankly, biased comments. Uh, they can be corrected, and these comments will probably be a little off base as well. And it, it became clear to me, as we were organizing this conference, 
that I was out of touch with a lot of things and falling behind the times, and this will be reflected in what I say. Now, I think it's well known that for me, the subject has a structure, and this structure, which I refer to as functoriality, such that a great deal of other things will flow from it once it's established. So, Arden's conjecture and, and the general Ramanujan conjecture in the correct form will flow just from the structure. So, in some sense, these two conjectures will be seen eventually, one hopes, although at a rather deeper level, to be like Bayes' conjecture on the Tamagawa number. And the Tam Bayes' conjecture on the Tamagawa number, which looked at the very beginning to be quite deep, we know now is simply belongs to the elements of the subject. If you understand anything about the analytic theory of automorphic forms, then you, you, you know how to prove the Tamagawa number of a, of a simply connected group is one. It's not a theorem anymore. It's just a fact, the fact that the attention is not drawn to it, you might not even notice. Now, I just observe that in this connection that we wouldn't be in a position even to think about the general theory of automorphic forms if Siegel hadn't created it, hadn't created a general theory of automorphic forms as a result, in, in particular and largely, of his efforts to deal with the question of the volume of fundamental domains for tori, so the average measure of quadratic forms. So one shouldn't uh, be too wrapped up in the general theory. It's there because Siegel attacked special questions. Now, it also, I think, goes without saying that you're not going to get functoriality for nothing. After all, class field theory is a part of it, and so that a good deal of number theory is implicit in this structure, and the reasons for the structure are probably not going to reveal themselves. They haven't revealed themselves yet, I would say, without very close attention and examination of individual cases in order to get at the, to get at the clues, necessary clues. Now, let's come back to that later. Now, once functoriality is established in that, in the, in that event, which we, I, we, can, let, we can anticipate, the next goal is presumably to deal with the Hass of A conjecture. So to identify motivic L functions, which are the factors of Hass of A zeta functions with automorphic L functions. Now, the most famous achievement along these lines so far, and presumably it will remain for a very long time, the high point of the subject is, of course, the proof of the Taniyama conjecture, which is known in various more precise formulations as the shimura taniyama ve conjecture. And this proof was proof not only invokes some of the very little hard information that we have on functoriality, but it relies also in various ways on our knowledge, both ancient and modern I have here, of the modular curves, which are the simplest example of what we call shimura varieties. So these are varieties that are defined over the complex numbers as quotients of homogeneous spaces by discrete groups and it was important, I think, Shamor was the first to appreciate. And he was also the first to begin to demonstrate, at least, uh, the generalization of the class of a complex multiplication that they could be defined in a natural way over number fields. Now, I think, and one should be aware of this, that it's no means clear to what extent the ultimate general theory of motivic functions will pass through Shamor varieties. But nonetheless, as a start, we would like to understand the arithmetic, arithmetic of these varieties at least insofar as it affects the motivic L functions attached to them. Now, you know presumably that there are promising starts for various varieties associated to some groups, for example, the unitary group, but that basic general problems remain. So to define them correctly, these varieties correctly over appropriate rings so that what one can reduce and so on, uh, to understand their compactification and to understand how the points at infinity contribute to the zeta function. From that point on, and as granted the fundamental lemma that's going to be discussed in, these, uh, in this conference, and, and the trace formula, which we'll not much discuss, uh, there's a fairly well-defined path, I think, to the comparison of the zeta functions, the zeta function of these Shimura varieties with automorphic L functions. But rather than explaining these general problems in any detail, which is one option, uh, the organizing committee decided or opted for a closer examination of one case. And this is apparently, I don't know, a case to which the number theorists attach for reasons that 
let's, that I hope will be explained during the course of the conference, and in particular perhaps in the lectures of Skinner and Vile. I don't know how much they're willing to tell us. Uh, but I hope they will understand why this particular variety, which is the Shimura variety attached to the symplectic group in four variables, is of particular interest. In any case, that's the variety, that's the Shimura variety on which we decided to focus. And there will be three lectures on that. There will be the lecture of Lomont, which will be, which will tell us about the variety and about the zeta function. But there are other things that you need to know if you're going to handle the zeta function, which are more representation theoretic or which belong to harmonic analysis. And one of the lectures is the lecture on Arthur and multiplicities. And this will really be the only time you see anything, if you see anything in there about the trace formula. And so Arthur and multiplicities and L predicates. And the second one will be a lecture by Hales on the fundamental lemma. So you'll get some idea of what the fundamental lemma is, which I point out to those of you who don't know, is an enormous stumbling block in the theory. It's uh, ruined the careers of many people, myself included, and I think it's on the point of ruining the careers of others. I, we had a gloomy trio here all winter of people who claimed they were trying to prove the fundamental lemma. Uh, in any case, in a more serious, so uh, Arthur's lecture, I said, will be the only way, only lecture in which, I think, in which the trace formula appears, and that's, in some sense, a defect of this conference. Obviously, in any serious, longer conference on automorphic forms, uh, a lot more time would be devoted to the trace formula. So, it, and I think this is fair. I think that it is the best way to encourage interest in the study of Shamur varieties is to persuade number theorists of the arithmetical importance of the theory for specific varieties. But even so, for those people of an older generation, for someone like myself, the general theory has a great deal to be said for it. And uh, I'm a little troubled by the fact, I just mentioned that I'm troubled, there's nothing to be done about it, that we didn't devote at least one lecture to it. And I have here some strange comments. I'll read them. I'm not sure whether I still agree with them. I wrote this a few days ago. That the development of the theory of Shamor varieties requires skills and techniques that with the departure of Groth Grothendieck are cultivated less than they once were. So that I sometimes fear that if it does not occur soon, there will be no one left to carry it out. And I don't think that's a completely ungrounded fear. But it, it may be. So... The identification of motivic L functions with automorphic L functions, of course, only a beginning. One wants to use the knowledge acquired in establishing it to deduce hard Diophantine or geometric, real geomet Diophantine or geometric information. And for example, that's supposed to be implicit in the values of L functions at various points. Now, I don't want to overstep the bounds of my, of my competence. I won't say anything more. We wait for the lectures of Skinner and Wiles. And again, I'll express my hope that uh, they'll not be too reticent and that they'll be generous and give us some idea into what they foresee. They don't have to reveal everything, but uh, I think we'd all appreciate knowing more. Now, from Hale's lecture, you're going to see that I think that the fundamental lemma, even in its simplest manifestation, is difficult. In its general form, which appeared when st uh, the, ge the general form of the fundamental lemma actually grew out of the theory of Shamur varieties, and their zeta functions, and it turns out, I'm surprised that many people, myself included, that it has a great deal of combinatorial and topological depth. A uh, depth. So, once again, since I don't know what's happening here, prudence suggests that I say no more. But McPherson is going to talk about these things, and I hope. So you give us some idea of what extent that depth has been plumbed. All right, so that, if you've kept count, is six of the lectures. Now, before going on the others, I want to say something about functoriality. So automorphic forms are, of course, attached to <coughs> groups G over, over a number of fields, or as you'll see in the lecture of Lafour, over function fields, over finite fields. And I don't think much will be said, maybe in the lecture of Shahidi, I'm not sure, 
that attached to G, there's a complex group, GL, or actually a family of com complex groups. And one should stress this, that this group, these groups depend upon a Galois, sufficiently large Galois extension of, K of the ground field. And for many purposes, but not all, K can be fixed. And then what you associate to an automorphic representation is a family of conjugacy classes. One conjugacy class for each prime or for almost every prime, P of the field K, and this sits in GL. So this sits in GLK. So the class you have to, for each K, you have this family of classes. So P varies, right? P is just the prime of K. And it varies, and this, this is the conjugacy class, semi-simple conjugacy class. Now, it's, I want to emphasize that these things depend upon K. And I would be inclined, if I had to choose a name, to call them Frobenius Hecker classes for reasons that I'll explain. They're sometimes called Sataki classes, but this is a misunderstanding of what Sataki actually did. Sataki was interested in a structure and proved the structure theorem for Hecke algebras over arbitrary for, for arbitrary groups, reductive groups over a local field. Th this parameterization is only relevant, and I want to stress this, for for quasi Split groups that, and so, and for uh, groups that split over an un unramified extension. So it's only pertinent for a much smaller class of groups than Sataki considered. And in addition, it's very important to understand that you this class. This class is defined for all K, so that the classes, of course, include the Frobenius classes so that appear in arc Nell functions. In particular, if the group G is trivial, these, this family is still interesting. It's a class of Frobenius classes. Now, the parameterization was, in fact, suggested by the need to have... Uh, a simple way of uh, describing the L functions that arise when you, uh, say, study Eisenstein series, and, and also by the arc L functions. Now, and it's from the, this, this parameterization, basically, that suggested functoriality. And what does functoriality suggest? It suggests, says the following. Suppose you have two groups, G prime and G double prime, and suppose you have maps, so these are complex groups, and these maps are supposed to be, I didn't say it, but they have natural projections under the Galois group. And what functoriality says, it predicts in its first crude form, is that if you have an automorphic representation here with classes A, P of pi prime, then associated to phi is say, an automorphic form for this group with classes A sub P of pi prime, which are just equal to, which are given just by taking the map under phi of, uh, if you like, I'll put it this way, of the class of associated to pi prime. So that's what the crude form of functoriality says, suggests. And anyway, I want to remind you is that with experience, one can formulate this better in a way that's more likely to lead to a proof. Basically, what you should say, what you should try to prove, is that whenever you have an automorphic representation pi of a group G, then it says that you should be able to attach to it uh, a subgroup, I'll call it H pi, 
of G to be emphasis. This is not just one subgroup, it's a family of subgroups. So there should be, I think of it as one subgroup, but it's just would be a subgroup of to associate the pi, there should be a subgroup of GLK, one for each K, so the compatible family of now and this group will be basically, or this collection of groups will be basically a collection, uh, an L group in its own right. For example, if pi was an automorphic re representationist of Galois type, so one associated to a, a finite dimension, a, a complex representation of the Galois group, then this group would be just the L group of the trivial group, which means that this is just a Galois group of K over F, and so this collection would be just a collection, a compatible collections of, of, of the Galois group of K over F embedded in GLK. So that's probably what you should try to prove, and I don't want to, and I, I don't want to say anything more about it here, but that for me is, I think, the critical problem in the subject, analytic subject now. So this, as functoriality, there are other critical problems around it, but this, for functoriality, this is something that I think one should try to show. There, there's something to do. I don't know whether you can show it, but I think you, you can, there's something, if you want to think about it, there are things you can think about. You don't just, problem that you don't need simply to stand and look at from morning to night without any idea or without making any calculation, without doing anything. You can look at the problem and do, find something to do. All right. So what I say here, so that I am becoming more and more convinced now that we are beginning to understand, thanks to Arthur, what the trace formula can do for us in the context of endoscopy, and that's really where the trace formula, the present method for applying the trace formula work, that we should turn to this general problem for which we will need to develop not only the techniques we are learning from Arthur, which are spectral theoretic and representation theoretic, but also analytic techniques more familiar from classical analytic number theory. So in the early years of the general analytic theory of automorphic forms, we had enough to do to understand the consequences of the spectral theory and the representation theory. Indeed, this is a development that is far from over, but it is sufficiently mature that we can now move ahead, taking and it to some extent for granted. Now, those who have listened to Arthur over, over this year know it's not so easy to take for granted, but nonetheless, it's there and is a comfort and, and uh, uh, functions as a sort of security blanket if you want to think of other, if you want to try to go beyond it. So, so this is, but it's sufficiently mature that we can now move ahead, taking it to some extent for granted and combining the insights already acquired with others still to be discovered. So for one, so for me at least, one major purpose of the conference is to continue and deepen the dialogue already begun between the two different approaches to the analytic theory. I mean, on one hand the approach to Arthur, and on the other hand the approach to the analytic theory represented, or say Arthur and Shahidi on one hand, and on the other hand that represented by Duke and Ivanich. I think it's really important that uh, these two groups be together at the same place and the same time and that we try to learn from both of them. But there is another point of view which has been cogently arg argued on many occasions by Peter Sarnak and various techniques have been used to establish partial results for functoriality. And it is certainly the results they provided, that these techniques provided, that have persuaded any substantial number of mathematicians that there is something to it. It's not entirely true, but it's partially true. The I, on the other hand, who for obvious reasons was more easily convinced than many others of the truth of functoriality, uh, I looked at these methods with a certain reservation because of their obvious limitations. But Sarnak, I think, argues, presumably on the principle that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, that the results they yield are already good enough for many of the traditional purposes of analytic number theory, so that it's valid and indeed laudable to exploit them to this end and then wise to Im unwise to abandon them prematurely. Now, I think this will be abundantly clear from the lecture of Shahidi, which is the next lecture 
And I think he had plans to describe some of the available methods for dealing with special cases of automorphic L functions and uh, special cases of functoriality and also their number theoretic relevance. Now, I confess I don't actually know, I don't have any idea at all what Ivanich and Duke are going to talk about. And I don't think they're going to talk about the existence of H pi. And I think H pi, and I think they'll probably, their lecture will probably at first glance seem a long way from the lecture on Arthur, of Arthur's there are multiplicities for the symplectic group and four variables. Nonetheless, I'm persuaded that to penetrate the theory of automorphic, the analytic theory, especially of automorphic forms in any depth, we, uh, and then I, uh, I think we is probably wrong, I think it's probably you, I'm out of it for obvious reasons, cannot content herself with learning the techniques of Duke and Ivanich on the one hand, or of Arthur, say, and Shahidi on the other, but will have to make an effort to master both techniques. Now, I confess that I, I've seen, uh, looking at the people attending various seminars over the past year, that there are not many young people who take this particular challenge seriously. I was, uh, my pessimism was somewhat alleviated when the, uh, just after I wrote that, uh, describe, thinking about my pessimism and describing that, sitting in a seminar, and I noticed a young man down the aisle from me or down the row of seats from me had two books on his lap. One was the voluminous tome of Knapp on representation theory, and the other was a book on the Hardy Littlewood method. <laughs> so I'm optimistic. Uh, at least that gives a little occasion for optimism. And for a day or two, I was optimistic. But then to thinking about birds again, I remembered that one swallow does not make a summer. So I don't want to rest all my hopes <laughs> on this one young man. Now, in a slightly different vein, the refinement of global functoriality proposed by Arthur and suggested by his analysis of the trace formula has led to a much clearer concept of Ramanujan's conjecture and has to a much clearer notion of its possible consequences. I didn't mention here, but really I was thinking of pi, that pi should be a Ramanujan type, which is a notion that is implicit in the, or even almost explicit in the ideas of Arthur. So, and Arthur's conjectures have clarified, of course, to some extent what one should do with the very difficult local problem of classification of unitary representations, and that both for real groups and for piatic groups. This problem is very hard, and I'm hoping, or if I'm not mistaken, Leglant is going to tell us something about that and also about the global form of Arthur's conjectures. Now, the local re representation theory, which has come, just come up, is, of course, an essential part of the theory of automorphic forms. So on many number theoretic problems, you just cannot avoid discussing ramification. You should, should know how. Uh, so that a local understanding of representation theory and the relation with local representations or with representations of the local Galois group is important. And presumably that we want sooner or later to have local demonstrations of local results. Uh, but you have a long way to go. Uh, that, uh, even so, there's a, a great deal we could say about local theory right now that we're not saying our time is limited and we're only going to have one lecture which deals, I think, besides McLamp, insofar as she deals with the local theory, and that is the lecture of Taylor. Now, of course, Taylor's theory, and it's going to discuss the results of uh, Taylor Harris and also uh, this proofs of similar results by NER. Uh, local consequences of global theorems. Uh, and they encourage a great deal of confidence in the local prediction. Uh, but nonetheless, and one should say this, like so many of the results we have, we have at present in theory of automorphic forms, the uh, methods which involve uh, the theory of Shimura varieties are perhaps not the final methods. And what I said it would have been good to have devoted a little bit of time to efforts to construct purely local theory, but we just didn't have the time. Now, there is, of course, for better or worse, something is known as the Langland program. But it's not always clear to me just what this program is. <laughs> I mean, for me, it would be functoriality. 
but it often seems to be what I thought of it, what was an apt, what was an afterthought, in fact, namely to be the problem of showing that all motivic L functions are automorphic L functions. But of course, in fact, and insofar as the phrase means something to people outside of automorphic forms, or outside of mathematics, even say within topology or within physics, it means something completely different. It means the theory created by Drenfeld that he uh, referred to as the geometric Langlands theory. But it is a different theory, and it's a theory, theory over function fields, which can be thought of as part of function fields over finite fields, about, about which Lefort will talk, is in some sense part of the theory of automorphic forms. But when you get over the function fields over the complexes, it's not really the uh, theory of automorphic forms anymore. And it seems to me that the geometric theory is significant in ways that transcend, that transcend the confines of automorphic forms, and in ways of which few of us here have any notion. So Geisgori and Valenson, wittingly or unwittingly, have assumed a titanic task to make this geometrical, even physical, significant, comprehensible to an audience, many members of which do not have a great deal of geometrical experience and much less any experience with theoretical physics. So we have a lot to learn, and we do not expect to become perfectly conversant in two hours with all ramifications of the theory or to become fluent in, say, the connections with mere symmetry. That's inspired by reading uh, the the proposal of one of our applicants in topology last year, right? So, uh, and, uh, now, I, I said here that I confess I, that I hope to know a little more on Friday evening about these things than I do now. That probably will be the case, but I don't expect to know anything about the connections with mere symmetry. Uh, now, those of us who have been in Princeton for the last two weeks have a head start because we were treated to an excellent introduction in, to this subject by Geitzgore. But we tried to stress to the two speakers who may or may not have be here this morning that all of you were not that fortunate and that there are a large number of people here, young people here with backgrounds largely in algebraic number theory, analytic number theory, who would greatly appreciate an explanation of the geometric theory that was tailored to their needs. Now, I'm a little bit skeptical about that remark. I'm not sure that there are such young people in the audience. But it would be... Nice to think that there was. <laughs> so, I mean, but in fact, functuality as it appears in the geometric theory carries a, a conceptual conviction. I, I, it seems to be right in, in a way that is not present in functoriality over number fields and presumably will never be present in the same way for functoriality over number fields because that is going to demand in its proof probably analytic estimates and analytic number theory on the one hand and some very careful investigation of some algebraic number fields on the other. So, and besides, it seems to me that, if I'm, I don't know whether it's unfair to them or not, but conceptual insight is not always what number theorists, especially analytic number theorists, are looking for or what persuades them. <laughs> I, I think that's a fair remark. It's not intended to be offensive. I, I think they're looking for something different. <laughs> <laughs> so there are many other things, some important that we did not fit in. The theta correspondence, is, for one, is an example. So uh, it and its connections with functoriality have always been a mystery to me, and it seems to me that it's still a genuine challenge, and a challenge that, in spite of a lot of progress by people interested in the theta correspondence, has not yet been met. It's a challenge, it's a challenge to formulate clear conceptual principles that subsume all essential phenomena in which the theta to which the theta correspondence gives rise. All right. So, almost finished. So, before stopping, I want to stress once again, I said I repeat myself, how important it is, for those, it is for those who want a clear view of the subject to have some insight into the trace formula and into the general theory of Shamur varieties, to know what the trace formula can give with the help of endoscopy, so thus with the help of direct comparis comparison of the geometric sides of two trace formulas, what role the trace formula plays for Shamur varieties, 
What does Shamur study if Shamur varieties needs for its itself needs from algebraic geometry or from the theory of algebraic numbers? After all, the theory of Shamur variety is based ultimately on a being class field theory. Should, I think people should know what the fundamental lemma is, how it is used, why it is difficult, and what the limitations of, say, these methods are, the trace formula methods. Although they're far from exhausted, they nonetheless have limitations that it's a good idea to understand. Now, the study of particular varieties and particular groups plays itself out to a large extent against the background of general insight. On the other hand, and, and this is again the spirit, I think, of this conference, without the desire to learn about specific groups for, for specific reasons, most mathematicians will have no incentive to learn anything about the general theory. So some balance has to be struck. And so, moreover, the methods favored at present in the general theory, which are basically spectral methods, so particular familiar, in particular familiar analytic tools like differential equations or Fourier analysis or representation theory, whatever their power and whatever their necessity are probably not enough. So a balance has to be struck in another sense, or rather a bridge has to be built between these methods, which are methods used in large part by Selberg, although he himself is an analytic number theorist, by Harris, Chandra, and Arthur, and those and methods from the analytic theory of numbers. So I don't know whether you will feel on Saturday that uh, the organizers and the lecturers have managed to strike this balance or to build the bridges, but I hope that you'll at least be persuaded that some bridge building is necessary. Now, that's all I had to say. And uh, yes, he's, he's here. I wanted, yes, I wanted to say that the director of this institute, as you all know, is a mathematician and who has contributed to his contributions have in various ways influenced the development of automorphic forms, in particular his contributions to vanishing theorems for cohomology and to variation of Hodge structure. Uh, one can, I can say it briefly, I might as well say it briefly, why you, the, as far as vanishing of cohomology is concerned, vanishing of cohomology, partly through a student of uh, Wilfried Schmidt, had a direct influence on the study of GK cohomology uh, for the discrete series, and then it's quite a quick step from, from that to realize, to realizing that the appropriate automorphic L functions to deal with the zeta functions of Shamor varieties are those associated to the representation of the L group associated to particular minuscule weight. That was one way you see the Philip Griffith's influence on the theory of automorphic forms. Another one is curiously enough related to the same thing. If you look at uh, Deline's paper in which she in the, uh, this talk in the Bourbaki seminar in which he reviewed Shimura's work and gave more general proofs of the theorems, much clearer presentation of the subject, you'll see that he was influenced in that paper by Griffith's work on variation of Hodge structure. And you will see exactly that in his paper that same uh, minuscule weight appearing, but not as a weight of the L group, but as a co-weight of the group itself. In any case, I, I, the director is sitting in the back row, and now he, he could come up. I think he has to be provided with a microphone on the way up. Where is Michael Kempton? You don't need one. No, I, as, as I hear, he, we're going to get one anyhow. Can you take that off? Then? No. Thank you, Bob. And I'd like to welcome all of you to this conference on automorphic forms. I'd like to thank the speakers and participants for coming. Many of you came from far away to the Institute for uh, this important conference. I'd also like to thank the National Science Foundation for their support of this event and more generally for their support through the years of the scientific activities in the School of Mathematics here at the Institute. 
I think uh, most of you know that the theory of automorphic forms has a long tradition here at the Institute and in also at the University. Uh, Carl Ludwig Siegel, although he did not do his work on quadratic forms uh, here, that was done in the 30s, continued his work on uh, bounded domains, several complex variables, uh, theta functions, and fundamental domains in the 40s when he was here. There was a very important volume, in fact, that came out of a seminar he ran, which I think many of us learned from as students. In the 50s, the work on, by Atlas Selberg on his trace formula was done. And beginning in the 1950s, 1960s, with uh, the arrival of Andre Ve, Armand Borel, and Harris Chandra, uh, there was much activity in the general subject of automorphic forms. Uh, again, as a graduate student, I remember the work that they did on the rigidity of co-compact lattices, which was very influential to me personally. Uh, that was prompted by conjectures of Selberg. And later on, Vey's generalization of the Hecke uh, theory came in the late 1960s. Around this time also was the theory of the discrete series uh, by Harishandra, leading up to some of the things that, in fact, Bob was referring to a few minutes ago. At the university, there's been uh, an excellent tradition through the years carried out primarily by Shimura in the theory of automorphic forms, Shimura varieties, again, that Bob referred to. More recently, the subject of automorphic forms has been of great interest to faculty here at the Institute, including the uh, speaker before me, and at the university, uh, including the organizers of this conference, uh, the speakers here at the conference. Finally, uh, last but certainly not least, over the years there have been numerous members who have come to the Institute as visitors who had an interest in automorphic forms and I think were attracted here because of the activity that was going on in the subject and our traditions uh, in that area. Among the visitors, in fact, is the current academic trustee from the School of Mathematics who is one of the speakers here at this conference. So I think this is an extremely timely and uh, appropriate for the uh, Institute uh, topic to have a conference on. And I'd like once again to, uh, on behalf of the Institute as a whole, welcome all of you and thank you for coming.
here today is Professor Fridom Shaidi, Fridom Shaidi from Purdue University, and his title is L functions, converse theorem, functoriality. Thank you. I want to first thank the organizers for inviting me to speak in this wonderful conference. It's always a pleasure to be back at the Institute. And I apologize for using transparencies. I have already prepared some copies of it. If anybody is interested, I can give it to you. I know it's hard to take any notes, but I think it's usually more organized. So let me start with the, some usual and standard background about uh, holomorphic forms and mass forms. Uh, holomorphic modular cost form, F, we are, we're going to use F to denote one, or it will be a mass form with respect to gamma naught of N. They, well, I will assume that these are eigenfunctions for all the Hecke operators, and as well as Laplacian. Of course, that, that's relevant when K is equal to zero. We just pick up real analytic functions. And <coughs> I think I'd better pick this up of the box. And I will denote by a n the Fourier coefficient of f, and I'll assume that a1 is equal to 1, and as usual, a p is p to the k minus 1 over 2, alpha p plus beta p. And q denotes the rational numbers, and a q is the ring of adults. So that's a restricted product of q, p, and r with respect to the product of ring of integers of p adic fields. And there is a standard natural way of uh, embedding f as a sub-representation of uh, automorphic forms. These are L2 functions on GL2 of AQ and mod out by GL2 of Q and AQ star. I'm assuming the central character is one just for this moment and I'll change it immediately when I go to the general case. Pi F becomes an irreducible sub-representation and the usual stuff, you can decompose it as product of irreducible representations, pi sub P and I allow to infinity, which, which is of course R and at every other place, pi sub p is a reducible representation of GL2 of QP. As Langlands in his talk pointed out, you will have a conjugacy class parameterizing the representations at the, the representations at uh, unramified places. So, for almost all P, as probably everybody in this room knows, the class of pi P is parameterized by a semi-simple conjugacy class, so to say diagonal element, which will be that alpha P and beta P that are used in the, in the other transparencies. And there are two very important and immediate problems in, in number theory that show up, and Langlands pointed out to them, for a mass form. And one is the ramanujan petersons conjecture. So here, alpha p and beta p, you expect them to be of, of absolute value equal to 1. Or said in other form, you want even generalization of that, meaning that all these representations, pi sub p, be tempered. And this was proved for holomorphic forms in 1973. This is for q, I think even for a, a totally real field. This is not, com I mean, so far as I have heard, this is not completely proved, but one expects that the same circle of ideas work. The other case is Selberg's conjecture, and that is that if you look at the upper half plane and divide out by gamma naught of n and take delta, the Laplacian, which was in my first transparency, and look at the smallest positive eigenvalue for delta on this hyperbolic space, that has to be bigger than equal to one fourth. Well, these are two very important conjectures. They have been sitting around for quite a long time. They have been generating mathematics. 
which is very important, and we haven't been able to do anything about them except for partial results. Now that I'm in the setting of representation theory, it's better to move on immediately to a general number field because the tools are there. So as usual, F will be a number field. A sub F would be the ring of adults of this number field. Pi would be an irreducible infinite dimensional sub-representation of L2 of GL2 of AF divided by GL2 of F. A star of F always shows the center. Omega is the central character, so I'll fix an omega, and then I'll want representation appearing there, and I want it to be cospidal, so it appears as a sub-representation there, and I will, it will not be of dimension one, so it will be infinite dimensional. Again, the representation pi becomes a tensor product, just because A itself, I mean, the ring of adults is a product. And again, for almost all the places, we have the usual situation that the representation is completely determined by the conjugacy class of a, of a diagonal element, of a semi-simple element inside GL2C. It's very easy to show that then Ramanujan Peterson means that these things must be of absolute value one. And I'm hoping and I'm pretty sure that these will be addressed by both Duke and Ivanik in their lectures. Um, So I think this is some introduction. So what I'm going to do is some way of progressing in these conjectures. Any progress on them is quite important. In what follows, I'm going to discuss how the method that I have been using, plus some recent converse theorems of Kogdel, Pietetsky, Shapiro, can lead to some real serious jumps on these conjectures. I'm not going to spend too much time on conjectures. There are other applications, and I'm expecting other people will talk about these other applications. So let me give an example of functoriality. Langnon has talked about it very briefly, and I'm just going to stick to the case of GL2, and I'm going to talk about the case of functoriality for GL2. As usual, I'm going to fix a positive integer m, and I'm going to look at the polynomial P of XY, a homogeneous polynomial of degree M. For a group element G in GL2C, I will choose, I mean, there is a simple way of finding its symmetric power. And you can easily look at the polynomial when you change variables XY going to G of XY and see what happens, what happens to the coefficients of this polynomial. The matrix which does that, you can just take that to be your definition of symmetric M to power of G. <laughs> This map, g going to m symmetric power of g, gives the m plus one dimensional irreducible representation of GL2C. So that I will denote by sim m, and this is called m symmetric power representation of GL2C. For almost all v, the usual things happen. The pi v is parameterized by a semi-simple conjugacy class alpha v, beta v, diagonal. And if you take the sim m of that, it's very easy to see that should be m minus one. So that's, that's in M of TV, and that belongs to GLM plus 1 of C. And then if you look at this semi-simple conjugacy class, it's by the general theory, we know that it, it is attached to this semi-simple conjugacy class, a representation of GLM plus 1 of FV. And that's an spherical representation. Luckily, we don't have to worry about only spherical representations or the ones at infinity where Langlands has looked at this situation generally and we can attach things to, symmetry to, to any representation. In the case of GL, we now have the results of Harris, Taylor, and Henyard that we can attach really to this representation symmetric. I mean, if, if I, if I, there's a way of defining symmetric mth power of pi v. I'm going to tell you what that is in a minute.
Well, from the local Langlands conjecture for GL2, we know that the representation pi v can be parameterized by representation from the by a two-dimensional representation of the link wave group. So there is a homomorphism phi sub v going from W prime F sub V to GL to C. And that that is attached to a representation pi V. This was done in this case by Kutzko and Langlands. Langlands is general, Kutzko is GL2. And therefore we can look at the representation sim M of phi V, literally by composing sim M with phi V and pick up a four M M plus one dimensional representation of the the lean way group. And then to that Harris, Taylor, and Henniard attach the representation, which I will denote by sim M of pi V. Now, one important case of functoriality is in the case of the symmetric powers. Now, this is the conjecture of Langlands. In general, as we said that that's how Langlands program is defined, we take the tensor product of all these symmetric powers, and conjecture asserts that this has to be an automorphic representation of GLM plus one of AF, i.e. that it appears in L2, and therefore there is a dual or there is a transfer or a transfer from automorphic forms on GL2 to automorphic forms on GLM plus 1. So this is functoriality. This is the, probably the best non-trivial example of it. And why symmetric powers are so important is because basically for GL2C, they give you all the, represent, all the irreducible representations of GL2C, so up to, up to a uh, character, and it's very important to study them, and there, there are, of course, many, many other reasons as we will proceed. Now, as soon as you have the, as soon as you have the Ramanujan Peters, uh, as soon as you have this conjecture proof, even less than that is enough, but even uh, as soon as you have this, both of these conjectures immediately follow, both the Ramanujan Peterson and Selberg conjecture, they will both follow. And there is a very simple way of showing that. I mean, you will end up being inside. So let me, I can do that by hand here. You will end up being inside. You are moving to GLM plus one of AF. And you will, you will, be ha you will, ha you will have a representation whose complex parameters are alpha, alpha V to the M, alpha V, M minus one, beta V. And then if something sits in GLM plus one of AF, you have nice bounds for, for these things. So you're going to have, say, for example, these are bounded by QV to the one half. If you like, then you divide out. And if you have it for all M, you will immediately see that this will be less than or equal to one. And similarly for beta. And beta and alpha are the, I mean, in absolute value, are inverses of each other. And therefore, you have both of these that are equal to one. Of course, less may be enough, but we have tried and it doesn't work. So let me go back here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you some cases of functoriality that were recently proved, and they, are quite, they were quite surprising. And they, they have incredible consequences. So let me start with two of the theorems, two of the results. Theorem one is a joint work with Kim. Symmetric cube of pi is automorphic. So it appears in the space of automorphic forms. We know exactly it is cos to the when it is cos to the And it is cos to the unless it is of uh, dihedral or tetrahedral type. And then also in a separate paper, Kim proved that sin four is also automorphic. <coughs> the biggest problem with the transparency lecture is that you will start having dry throat. <coughs> so let's start getting consequences. One corollary of knowing the, that symmetric cube and symmetric fourth are automorphic is that we can prove this bound 
that alpha V and beta V will be between QV to the minus a ninth and QV to a ninth, and this is quite this is quite general over any number field. And the way this is proved is, I mean, just there is things develop very fast. So let me write a little bit what happens. First of all, we knew that the oldest, I mean, the, the earliest result, which really resisted quite a, almost more than a decade, is that we knew that alpha V and beta V are both less than QV to the one-fifth and QV to the minus one-fifth, and then there was an improvement over P, and that they were less than equal to P to the 5 over 28. And of course, the other way. And a number of people are attached to this. It's uh, Duke, Ivonik, uh, Hofstein, and Baum. And this was done earlier. I mean, in the case of over Q and with equality, it goes back to Sarah and a number of other people. And over an arbitrary number field, I proved this in about 12 years ago. And then uh, Lua, Rudnik, and Sarnak proved the, the, I mean, improved on the Selberg, and they showed that the lambda is bigger than or equal to 0.21. They're still away from 0.25. And this was fairly recent. This was a couple of years ago. And then when we established symmetric cube, we improved that to, uh, we improved that to QV to the 5 over 34, and QV to the minus 5 over 34, using uh, some estimates of lower rooting Sarnak on GL4. And then, as soon as things started falling, we got better results. But the final one, which is the one that I mentioned, the one night, I should, I, I still need this, this transparency. The one night came after you understand that these things are automorphic, and you use some old, old result that I proved 12 years ago about local L functions obtained from this method, and then you will get one night. Now, when you are over Q, when you are over Q, this was further improved by Sarnak team and Sarnak, and you can move to 7 over 64, and you can also, I should, I should also mention that on the, on the front of the Selberg, we did something, oh, wait a minute, 228. <laughs> that, that, that's, my, that's my anecdote. 228, as Sarah would force you to put those periods afterward. And so, and then the final thing is that we can in fact have that this smallest eigenvalue is 0 0.2376, so it's really like 0 0.238. So we are getting close, but we are not there. And these are the improvements that you can do. It will take some time to improve on these. And then with respect to Sato-Tate's conjecture, we proved a bunch of results. We looked at the symmetric powers, and we looked at the L function for symmetric powers up to m equal to 9, and we could show they are all meromorphic and satisfy functional equation. And if the central character is trivial, we showed that these symmetric powers are invertible at s equal to 1 for m up to m equal to 8. Again, the same way that happened for symmetric fifth many, many years ago, we could show that symmetric ninth is going to be possibly having a zero or a pole at one. So now there is a technique of cell. It says that if you have information like these, you will be able to improve on the, I mean, not in, I mean, to, to, to get some evidence towards Sato Tate. And we could, I mean, that, that's already in one of my papers, a letter from Sarah. And then we did that improvement. And I mean, this is a standard machinery. As soon as you have all this work, then you pump it in. And this will just tell you what you will get. And I thought I checked all these. I mean, I've been proofreading for the past week. And still, they're all there. And uh, there are sets of positive lower densities for which this 
AV is bigger than 1.68 minus epsilon, given an epsilon, or less than minus 1.68 plus epsilon. So it shows that there's, an inf there's a, a large class of primes when you can have things even close to two. I mean, so the, 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 this, uh, the, equivalent, uh, the equidistribution seems to hold. Well, <laughs> next result that we could prove is that there is a conjecture of Arthur on multiplicities for GSP4, and I'm sure he's going to talk about it in his lecture. And if you assume that you are going to have some statement about Ziegel modular forms of low weight, let me And you can show that Ziegel modular forms of weight three exist, and they will be in the same of same same L packet as symmetric cube of pi. And here I'm assuming pi is a non-CM form of weight two, and symmetric cube of pi is considered as a form on GSP four AF. So you assume, I mean, there is there is a body of work already done uh, by Jacques Pietetsky. Shapiro and Shalikon lifting from GF4 to GSP4. So I recognize it as something on GSP4. Realize that this one is at infinity as a generic uh, component, and Arthur's multiplicity theorem allows you to assume to if you look at if you look at the component at infinity, it's a generic one. So it's a discrete series. It is a generic discrete series. But in the L packet of that, there is a holomorphic, I mean, of course, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic go together in GSP4, and then Arthur's multiplicity conjecture tells you that, in fact, you can, you can take that one, you can move in the packet of this thing globally, and you, you can pick that one with the uh, discrete series at infinity, and that will appear. So this is, this you can, this you can prove. Now, one more color that you can get is that Suppose that uh, sigma is a two-dimensional irreducible representation of icosahedral type, and assume pi of sigma exists. We know quite a bit of examples and infinite family by the work of Bowser, Baron Shepard, Dickinson, and Taylor, that this thing exists, this pi of sigma exists, and Langlands was talking about that h sub pi, and what he has in mind is that one uses the trace formula to do the same thing. Then if you look at the L function for symmetric cube of sigma, this is a four-dimensional. It is irreducible Artin L function. It is primitive. It is primitive because the uh, A5 does not have any subgroup of index less than 5. And that L function is entire. So you get an example of an entire L function, an Artin L function. And <laughs> there are other applications which are proved already in our papers. And these applications are, uh, some of them I hope will be mentioned in uh, either Duke or Ivanish's lecture, their applications to analytic number theory. And let me tell you how these things were, were proved. It's clear that you have to somehow get the symmetric cube and symmetric quark. As soon as you have these things, as it was pointed out, as soon as you have functional reality, many things follow. And it's a very powerful conjecture, and whenever you prove a case of functoriality, there are in incredible amount of consequences. And so how did we prove the existence of these things? We proved them by proving another case of functoriality. And so let me mention that. I'll, I'll get back to this. Suppose I have two possible representations, pi 1. pi 1 and pi 2 of GL2 and GL3. Well, for, again, we, we're going to use the, I mean, in the, in the case of GL2, we can use Kutzka and Langlands, and in the case of GL3, we can use Henniard and Langlands. And we have homomorphisms 
of the wave group two dimension to I mean GL two C and also the homomorphism to GL three C. I think she dropped this one too. So let me parameterizing these two representations. So this has been this should have been written differently anyway. And well we take these two homomorphisms, these two representations, we tensor them. So you pick up a six dimensional representation of uh, the Dulin Way group, and you will attach to that the box product, I mean, you will attach to that the tensor product of phi 1v and phi 2v, and again go back, use the uh, Harris Taylor Henyard, and this will allow you to pick up a, a representation of GL6 of fv, which we denote by this box product. This is the same notation as the way, I mean, the, the global L group was introduced by Langner in his uh, lecture at Corvallis. So we use that in that. So this is the representation of GL6 of FV. Then we tensor this over all the places, over all the uh, places V. And this gives us an irreducible admissible representation. What we do, we show that this is, this is automorphic. And therefore, the functorial dual to GL2C cross an intense of GL3C to GL6C, it just sends G1, G2 to G1 tensor G2. So this should have been product. <coughs> to G1 tensor G2 exists. Now, as soon as we have this, then we apply this. Uh, we apply this case of functoriality to, to the case when pi 1 is pi and pi 2 is out of pi. This is the gelbar jockey lift of pi. As soon as you do that, this decomposes. As soon as you do that, this, so if you take pi out of pi, that's going to be equal to, I mean, let, let me, this out of pi, you can just take it to be equal to same cube of pi. So if you take, let me just do it by hand here. So this is alpha v, beta v, and then you are really tensoring it by alpha, same, same squared, alpha v squared, alpha v beta v, and beta v squared. This is how you quickly do things. So you will pick up alpha v cube, and then alpha v squared beta v, and then alpha v beta v squared beta v cubed and then you're going to have alpha v beta v at alpha v plus beta v so you just pick up the you're going to pick up the symmetric cube of pi plus uh, pi tensor central character of pi you shave off this by the classification theorem and you immediately pick up the symmetric cube so picking up symmetric cube is no matter if you have that big theorem that the other one. Well, <coughs> so how do we prove this? As I said, we apply converse theorem. Converse theorem is very powerful if you try to lift things to GL. I'll talk about it, and that's part of my mandate to also talk about converse theorems. So <coughs> we applied recent converse theorems to our method, and let me explain now. I want to take a little bit of time. The well, converse theorem is quite a powerful tool in proving functoriality when one compares things with GLM. They have already been used in certain cases. It's in the Lafort's proof of lo global Langlands correspondence for GLN over function fields in one over finite fields. And in non-normal cubic base change of GL2 and GL3, Langlands tunnel proof of Artin's conjecture. And long way back in the existence of symmetric square uh, by Gelbart and Jacquet. And then there are a lot of other applications already, I mean, is used in Boyle's program and it has had a lot of other applications in, in arithmetic geometry. Now, here you absolutely need the integral representations for the product group GLN cross GLN. 
the, you express this, this L function that I'm about to define in a minute as a Mellin transform of functions attached to these two groups. And then using that Mellin transform, you show that the representation that you are interested in is really invariant on their, no, this is the rational point. So F is the global field, and this is the rational points. So you look at the represent, uh, global, uh, I mean, irreducible admi admissible representation of GL, of some GL of AF, and you want to prove that it is invariant on the GL of the rational points, the invariance properties of the Mellin transform allows you to see that, but then Mellin transform itself is an integral and in some sense has no use unless you, I mean, it has its use, of course, in giving you the properties, but supposing that you can find the properties somehow for what the Mellin transform is, then you can use that to prove this invariance. Now, the biggest thing that you're gonna need is the functional equation because functional equation is going to allow you to compare the to the, 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 the action of GL of the rational points, and you want to prove that it's invariant under that, functional equation practically tells you that it's invariant under enough generators of this group, so you will know that it is invariant there. You also need some analytic properties. You need to know that this Mellin transform is entire. You need to know that this Mellin transform is bounded in vertical strips, so you can apply the general theory that was already applied in Jacques Langmans to <coughs> to prove converse theorem. So let me first of all tell you what is this L function that I've been talking about. Well, we take two cost forms, cost pillar representations, pi tensor product pi V and pi prime tensor product pi prime V. These are representations of GLM and GLN of AF. Then again, we have the usual thing. We will have at almost all the places. Pi V corresponds to some semi-simple element, TV, pi prime V corresponds to T prime V. And the L function is defined by tensor product in TV and T prime V. And look at that times QV to the minus, and take the determinant, the standard definition of Langlands. And at every other place, we can use Harris, Taylor, Henniard. We, we look at the homomorphism phi sub V from W prime to GLM and W, I mean also phi prime V, and we look at the tensor product of them, and the local L function, it's shown that is equal to that. These local L functions were studied by uh, Jacquet, Pietesky, Shapiro, and Shalaika, and now we know that they are really our thin L functions due to this work. I also studied these, and I proved some of the properties as well. Now, <coughs> The, uh, there's a good number of people who contributed to this L function. This L function, in some sense, probably one of the most important L functions of the past century that we visited. And we have proved all the important analytic properties of these L functions. So I'm going to review that. The first thing you want to know that it is entire. And it's entire unless one representation is twist of the contravariant of the other one for some complex number S naught. It satisfies the functional equation S going to one minus S, standard one. It's bounded in vertical strips. This is reasonably new. These other ones have been new for some time. And this one, we, with Gelbart, we did this in, in, in full generality of all the L functions that we study. In the case of GLN, Rudnik Sarnak also gives a proof of this. It is non-zero for real of SBN equal to one. So these things were basically proved by mixing all kinds of things, and there are now different approaches to it. Let me now s state the converse theorem of Cogdell and Pietesky Shapiro. This is fairly recent. This is 1998, and it was published fast. So it was about when it was discovered. And I'm going to mention the one that we we used in our theorem, and that's that if you take a irreducible admissible representation 
pi, so it's a tensor product of GLM. Assume its central character is a Grossman character. Let S be a finite set of finite places of F, and let tau S of N be cospular representations of GLN AF, which are unramified at all V in S. So it's a very, it's a very, very nice way of looking at the problem. <coughs> Suppose I take sigma to be in tau s of n for all n all the way to n minus 2, and let's look at this product. This product I define locally because in every local place I can define it. I look at this and assume that it has a bunch of properties. Assume that this thing converges absolutely for real of s bigger than or equal to, I mean, lar say larger than 0 and is entire. Assume that it is bounded in vertical strips, and assume, of, of course, a finite width. <laughs> And assume that it satisfies a standard functional equation. When these things happen, we usually say that this is a nice L function. And then the theorem says that there exists a representation, automorphic representation pi prime of GLM of AF, such that pi V and pi prime V are the same. They are equivalent for almost for all those V's which are not in S, and in particular at infinity. So this is particularly remarkable because this allows us. In fact, allowed us already to say things about Selbach's conjecture. So it's not only about those unramified places that one can say something. Now, we apply this converse theorem to prove theorem to prove our theorem two. So let us just take S, what comes naturally to mind, take all those places, and both of these two representations are ramified, of course, finite. And let me take a sigma, a representation in tau S of n, for n, one, two, three, four. We just do what should be done. I mean, there's no mystery here. <coughs> we use the usual way of taking a highly ramified character at some place we not in this set of bad prime. So it's a gross in character. And we look at this triple L function. Now, this is where we come in. The triple L function, the way we could handle it is from, of course, using our own method. And what we do is that we have the, we have the, the I mean, we could define easily one for all the unramified places, just tensoring three representations. Or we could define it at the arc median places, just using Langdon's uh, classification and parameterization there. But then what about other places? As I said, we're going to use the, uh, our method. So we're going to define, using our method, extensions of these things to all the places. So we define these at all the places. And then we look at this product. And then we show that this, this L function, this triple product, is nice. So what are the different steps? We have to prove that it is uh, holomorphic. We, this is an observation of Kim that you basically have to look at the, if you take this car to be highly ramified, the L function would be entire. This is just comes from the theory of Eisenstein series. <coughs> I'm going to explain more about the method later. Then we need these results of Gelbart and myself. This is subtle because we're going to be using, this is, I mean, this is different from GLN in the sense that we're going to be using that L functions, which only appear in the constant term with many other L functions. I mean, they appear with two, three, or four L functions. And then you have to divide by L functions. So you will have to look at the inverses of L functions to the line all the way to real of s equal to 1. And there, you have to use the non-constant term. I mean, there, you use non-constant term. There, there is the, this kasselman shulaika formulas. And that, they tell you that the non-constant term itself is given by the inverse of similar L functions, L functions, different L functions that you have. And then, you inductively divide out. I'm going to do all, I'm going to tell you in a minute what 
groups and what is, how is the method done. And finally, we need the functional equation. And this is, <coughs> I proved this in full generality. And as you can see, we needed it in full generality, as, you, as I will tell you what groups we're gonna, we're gonna use. And I proved the properties that we need, and I conjectured some of them. And the, the definitions are very functorial. They are defined to agree with the Langlands parameterization in any other way, and so they work very conveniently with, with the theory. And in particular, as I said, our L functions, at the places when it is not in S, so at all the Archimedean places, the triple L function that we have is exactly the box product, the one defined by Harris, Taylor, Henyard, times this twist of the representation of that tau, tau S, and then we have really this triple L function is equal to this. And then I also define the L num the, the root numbers because we need that for the functional equation. And then we also needed a bunch of new results which developed in the past few years. And these are a number of people who contributed to that. There's a paper of Castleman and myself, Kim, Moish, Young, and Askari. And they are, they are, they are quite useful to us. We need them. <laughs> Well, the converse theorem tells us that there exists an automorphic representation. Remember that I, I, I'm going to define my local representation as the one given by uh, Harris, Taylor, Henyard, and I'll take the product of all those things, and then we know that there exists one whose components at, at places which are not in S are exactly the ones defined by Harris, Taylor, Henyard, and then using some kind of weak Ramanujan type arguments, these are due to Kogdo-Pietetsky earlier and with Ramakrishnan with some density, necessary density, you can really conclude that your representation is really fully induced representation from unitary cospular representations of either GL2, GL3, or GL4. Then up to now we haven't shown that really our representation is functorial, meaning that at all other places it is also the one defined by the box product. Then we start the uh, a different path. We move on, and this is this takes some time. And we finally show that this is our L, L factors and root numbers are exactly the ones defined by Harris, Taylor, Henyard, and as a result, by local converse theorems, the, we can choose one which has these as components. And here we have to use both base change, both normal and non-normal. Normal is Arthur Crozel and Langlands. Now, normal is J.K. Pietesky, Shapiro, Schleicher, and our own machine. At the end, we eventually had to use some local results. On Keta, it's using some ideas that Bushnell and Henyard gave us. So that's an appendix to our paper. And now, let me tell you what this method is that we have used. How did we get this information? And the method is an exploitation of the Eisenstein series. Well, what we need is a triple of a reductive group, a Levy subgroup, and a cospular representation of M. Then in the Eisenstein series, you have a constant term, and the theory of Eisenstein series developed by Langlands, that means with some other respect by Selberg, tells you what to expect from these constant terms. We know that we know the all the properties of the constant term. And we also know the non-constant term is just an integration over a compact set. Here, you want to assume, you will have to assume that your representation is what we call globally generic if you are going to the uh, non-constant non term. And then we have our, let me just do it in one simple case, case of GLN, of course. Then the constant term in the case of GLN is just going to be the, if, if I have, if I have, this is GLN, and I have a Levy in here, 
say just assume it's maximum. I have a cost flow representation here and a cost flow representation here. Then the L function that will show up in the constant time is only one. I'm going to have pi one. Let me forget about quantum gradient divided, and I normalize. And then, of course, this is you have to worry about the local places which are not unramified. And there, that's where all the local work comes in. And then, of course, you know the properties of this, and this goes back to Langner's or the product method. And then you will inductively get the properties of L. And of course, in most cases, there's more than one L function, and that's where the problem is. So let me go back to this. Now, to get these triple L functions, we need four of them. Then, so we need to twist, we need to twist our L function by this highly ramified, and we need to get things about this triple L function. And for n equal to one means that this is just a GL1 representation. The traditional ways to look at, as I said in that picture, GL5, and you can take GL2 plus GL3 as the maximal levy there. It would be no harm if I just take SL5, and I assume that the derived group is SL2 cross SL2 cross SL3. And then there is a natural way of putting representations from GLs on SLs, and it doesn't mat matter on the choice. And then you put a central character, and you can do it. This is not so important in here, but in the next one, it is important. Then you move on. Even in a spin, you may sort of save yourself a little bit. Not to twist by a GL2 representation, you have to go to the spin group, and that's a spin group of type a spin 10. Well, this is the root you remove to get your maximal parabolic. Your maximal parabolic is going to have derived group equal to SL. This is derived group of M is SL3 cross SL2 cross SL2. You can see it. This is SL3. This is SL2. This is SL2. And the usual way you take your representations on GLs, you restrict them, and in a natural way, uh, you pick up constituents there. It doesn't matter what you choose. The L function will remain the same. And then you have to put the central character that you will put on the A part of the, uh, of the levy, on the connected center of the levy. And you choose it appropriately so things work, and you will pick up the triple L function there. Then you are still have to do more because the converse theorems that we have are only up to n minus 2 at the moment. Then you go to a simply connected E6. This is, again, not hard to guess. You again remove this, and you pick up the triple L function for SL3 cross SL2 cross SL3. And then it's obvious what you have to do next. You have to go to. You have to go to E7. And do the same thing. And we could even go to E8 and use a weaker kind of converse theorem, but the, then there is local problems that we have to handle. So we just use the stronger theorem which was available. And then out of each one of these, you get. In each case, you get a number of L functions. The number of L functions, the number of L functions that you get would be one, two, three, and four in each case, respectively. So as I said, you will have to deal with dividing by, the, by these L functions. And that's where the delicacy comes in. And this, in this, this, this particular functorial product, this transfer is not endoscopic. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think it is, so as far as I know. Now, how do you get symmetric fork? There is the wedge squared transfer from automorphic forms on GL4 to automorphic forms on GL6. It just is dual to the taking the exterior square of GL4C. This is the sixth dimensional representation of GL4C. It goes to GL6C. Now, as soon as you have this dual, this is what Kim does. As soon as you have this dual, you apply this to symmetric cube, and you pick up symmetric fork. Now, Kim proves the functoriality using the same machine, and he uses spin, spin group, for n equal to 4, 5, 6, 7. The derived group is SLN minus 3 cross SL4, and n is more 4, 5, 6, 7, and then you will get all the L functions you need. This one is a twisted endoscopic case. It is 
very subtle because you will be looking at the cases that uh, Kotlitz and Shalstad have that your representation is fixed by uh, auto-automorphism up, up to a character. This would be of that kind. So it is subtle. It is <coughs> well, <coughs> now I want to talk about classical groups. This is another piece of work that we did, and that's, that's the first thing which was done. It's a joint work with uh, Cogdell, Pietersky, Shapiro, and Kim. And here we have this mapping of SP2NC to GL2NC, the standard embedding. One expects the dual, I mean the transfer from SO2N plus 1 of AF to GL2N plus of GL2N of AF. And in, in case that you choose the globally generic representations of SO2N plus 1, we did prove that this transfer exists. So we did it for the generic spectrum. Here, we used converse theorem. We used a little bit weaker converse theorem, I mean, which was also available. And the same story, this, this, this time you don't have to go to spin groups because you're just dealing with the, with the classical groups and you're going to be comparing it to, to a GL. And just use those diagrams that I, I did for, I did it for spin 10, you have to just do it for a spin, uh, for SP, I mean, in fact, SO, so let, let me just draw the picture. So this time, you just break it somewhere. I mean.